in the book of Revelation chapter 15 today. Uh, we've been through uh, chapter 12, uh, which was really interesting with the dragon, chapter 13, um, and the, uh, uh, the beast, and the second beast, and the mark of the beast, uh, chapter 14, the little recap of everything. And so chapter 15 now, it's, uh, it's a bit more of a, uh, it's a shorter chapter, eight verses long or so. But one of the things that I love about uh, looking at the book of Revelation is that I think of the, some of the words of the old hymn. Um, it says, the things of this world go strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. And the more... I study the book of Revelation, and as we're in it week after week after week, um, it really has a way of, of making the, uh, the the things of this world um, a little more dim, if you will. It puts it in perspective that the things that we get so worked up about maybe in the grand scheme of things aren't as crucial as um, are these monumental God things, his kingdom. His rule and reign on the earth. When you look at how things are going to go down, um, it makes things, uh, you know, that we're missing out on during the pandemic, just a little less important. Not not that they're not, not that they're not great things uh, to experience, and that we miss them. I understand all of that. Um, not that we don't want to get back to normal, whatever that is. Right now, I understand that. But when you look at the the the, the scope of, of human life and and uh, and eschatological end time history and and, and where it's going where, where we're going to be, when you look at the magnificent magnificence and and magnitude of God's kingdom, uh, especially in light of the the spiritual battle that's going on in the unseen world, some of the stuff that we get really upset about that we're missing out on in during this pandemic is um, is not really of ultimate consequence, and, and and the book of Revelation helps us helps us put things in perspective. So uh, it's it's a good study. It's good for us to study it. Let me just read chapter fifteen. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign: seven angels with seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Yeah, it's all of eight verses long. Let's look at it. Revelation 12, 13, 14 forms for us the interlude between the sounding of the seventh trumpet and the outpouring of the seven bowls of God's wrath. The seventh trumpet um, announced the period of the beginning of the end. And that was that happened way back in Revelation chapter 10. And so we've been in this interlude time. Now what we're about to see are the seven bowls of God's wrath. Back in Revelation 15.1, it talked about there were three woes remaining. This seventh, the, the seven bowls that we'll see poured out uh, of God's wrath is the third of the three woes. Um, and so this is, this is the culmination. The, the seventh trumpet introduced these. Uh, there were three woes that were going to fall upon the earth. This is the third of those three woes. And this is the wrath of God. These plagues 
will be poured out, the plagues of God, of the wrath of God, will be poured out only on those who worship the beast, who have the mark of the beast. Uh, Revelation 16, 2, that we'll see in the next chapter, makes that very clear. The, the, the plagues of God's wrath will not fall upon God's people. Um, God's people will be persecuted by the beast, but the plagues of God's wrath will not fall on God's people. We will be protected from them, even though we may in the, be in the midst of them. The purpose of the plagues, we have to remember this, is to bring men to their knees before God in worship, to turn people from the worship of the beast and turn them towards the worship of God um, in repentance. And again, we'll see that clearly in the next chapter in Revelation 16, verse 8. Uh, verse 1, Again, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven with the seven last plagues, last, because with them God's wrath is completed. Uh, the word sign is the same word. It means literally wonderful appearance. I saw in heaven a wonderful appearance. It was used in chapter 12 and verse 1 and verse 3 of the, in the exact same way, this wonderful um, appearance. Uh, wonderful, but they're plagues. So it doesn't mean wonderful like Disneyland. That means wonderful, monumentous, significant, exceptional. This is coming from God. These plagues are simply meant to awaken people to the ultimate reality of God. It, it's not that God gets excited about judgment or, 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 or punishment or pain or anything like that. He's not sadistic. All of his activity is meant to turn people to him. That we were created with a, with an with an internal desire and 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 makeup to worship, and without repentance, we end up worshiping the wrong things. And so, these plagues are meant to turn people's hearts back to right worship of God. Um, you know when certainly ourselves, but when our loved ones are in pain, oftentimes our prayer is, God, take the pain away. Relent in the pain that they're in. Um, however, especially when the pain that people experience is a result of sin, God often won't relent until one repents. Um... And oftentimes when God allows pain, not all the time, but oftentimes when God allows pain, um, it's for the purpose of causing one's knees to bend in submission to him. Because his blessings haven't done it, what he's kept from happening in people's lives is goodness, has is, is, is not bent their knees in submission. And so the only thing left is pain. Um... And, and, and again, I don't want to make a sweeping statement that all pain is because of sin. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but there may be times when our prayer is, God, hold back the pain in their life. And God says, if I hold back the pain in their life, we're out of recourse to get them to come to me. And so maybe along with, Lord, spare them the pain certainly right to pray that but along with that maybe our prayer ought to earnestly be and God cause them to repent be merciful to them in sparing pain and cause them to repent I mean, the goal uh, is to repent and come to God and worship him out of love um, just a thought that if, if, if you or you've got loved ones in pain you certainly Approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing there that you'll receive mercy and grace to help in your time of need. That's what the Bible says. But we also pray for them and and for us, uh, repentance, that our knees would bow before God. And in repentance, in our repentance, God would relent, cause the pain to cease. Just a thought. God's wrath comes to fulfillment in these seven bowls that we'll see in the next chapter. Um, it, it, it's not the, 
the final judgment of all things because the final judgment is still to come for Satan and the beast and the false prophet and the worshipers of the beast and when they're when they're cast in the lake of fire. But but this is this is the judgment of God's wrath that is about to fall. Um and again, just to be clear, it's not that God is angry. Um, you know, in, in as a, as a as an attribute, it's not that he's that God is uh, you know uh, arbitrarily vengeful. Um, the outpouring of his wrath in the time of the great tribulation that we'll see in the next chapter that this chapter sets up is an attempt to make the worship of the beast um, bow before a sovereign God. God is always at work seeking to turn people towards him to bring mankind to him because ultimately he's a merciful God and he knows that the best safest place the place that we were created to be is in relationship with him um, verse 2 and I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name they held harps given them by God this is a proleptic vision of, of those who have overcome, who have conquered the beast. This is, this is John sees in real time what is to come. Um, these that he sees um, standing beside a sea of glass mixed with fire. These are those, those martyr saints who in fact have been slain by the beast, but have persevered even in the face of martyrdom. These are those uh, who have been steadfast in their obedience and their submission to God. These are those who have endured to and through the end. These are those who have been faithful in their faith to Jesus. These are those who have refused to worship the beast who refuse to bow to the image of the beast, these are those who have conquered the beast by their martyrdom, that in death they did not deny the name of Jesus. Though the beast had been given power uh, over their life and to kill them, in reality their death is what conquered the beast. Uh, this is something we've, we've got to understand, and it's so hard for us to, to, to remember this. The purpose of the beast and the persecution of the saints is not necessarily the death of the saints. It's to ruin their faith. If the beast could ruin the saints' faith in any other way other than death, he would try that. The purpose is not death, because one who dies in faith is still in faith. So the purpose of the beast, and this is the purpose of, of the devil in the world right now. His purpose is to get you to deny your faith. To reject your faith. And he figures the best way to do that is to hurt your body. But if you die faithful, the purpose of the beast has been destroyed. Because the purpose is not necessarily death. The purpose is, the, the Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Not just physically, but ultimately your faith. To make you separated from God. See, we think that the that the main and only purpose of the devil is the destruction of life. And that may be a purpose of the evil one. But the greatest purpose of Satan is to destroy our faith in Christ. Uh, regarding the destruction of life, that may be what the devil uses to try to convince us uh, to question God's sovereignty and love and goodness. The destruction of life might be what the devil uses to get us to ultimately leave God. But the purpose, his purpose is not the destruction of our lives. His purpose is the destruction of our faith. All you're going to do is just see the book of Job. The devil, in talking to God, wanted to destroy Job's faith. Uh, and the only way he discerned that the, the best way to do that, eventually he, find, he figured, was to, was to hurt his life. Because the devil figured if he can hurt Job's life enough, Job would deny God. And the interesting thing is Job was faithful in his faith and ultimately received the restoration of everything that the devil tried to steal, kill, and destroy. Um, and so one of the things we've got to remember is, is, is that the point of the evil one is not, 
is not our physical destruction. The point is our spiritual destruction. And he will use physical means to get us to deny our faith. And so the point of these martyrs is though their lives were destroyed, their lives were, they were killed, the devil didn't win because they died in faith. And that was the devil's destruction. You know, I, I realize we're, we're, we're coming up on a year of this pandemic. Um, and, and, and we want everything to get back to normal. We want our kids to get back into school, certainly. I get it. We want them to get back into the fun things of, um, of, of being children and, and kids and teenagers that they've missed out on for the last year. We're looking into the future thinking, when is this going to end? You look at, I mean, here in California, we look at other parts of the country that seem to be doing much better, that are far more open. Um, and we just think, you know, why can't we be open? Um, other places that are open seem to be doing just fine and we're doing terrible and uh, we're doing terribly and, 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 and we're so locked down and closed. It just doesn't make sense and we just want things to go back to normal. We have to remember that the goal of getting through the pandemic is not to get back to normal. The greater goal is to live with and develop a faith that continues to trust, uh, that continues to be joyful, that God is sovereign, and to show others that God is still in control, that we're not shaken by this. Um, and ultimately, if we've got kids that are, you know, quote unquote, suffering through this, our, our goal as parents and as grandparents is to draw their attention to the greater things. Um, as frustrating as this might be, that it's not going to shake us and we're not going to, we're not just going to, you know, pick up and move and as tempting as that is, um, and, and that we're going to be faithful in the midst of this and joyful in the midst of this. Um, heck, the Bible says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. We can certainly endure, endure the pandemic with joy. Um, and it, it's just such an important thing for for us to learn ourselves, for parents to teach their children, for especially these, I think of these high schoolers that are going through their senior year. They lost out on the last part of their of their junior year. They're going through their entire senior year. Boy, could you imagine uh, the ability for those young ones to learn to go through difficulty with joy because of their relationship with Christ? What a great opportunity we have. What a great opportunity we have. What a great opportunity these kids have. Uh, to grow up in the faith and to not get discouraged and, and frustrated and weepy and depressed. and <laughs> Anyway, um, the conquerors of the beast are standing before the throne of God in the very presence of God. Boy, that's good stuff. See, the beast figured that in killing them, he would conquer them. But their death only made them move from worshiping God on earth to being in the very presence of God in heaven. What? It reminds me of what Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is so much better. Let me just die and get there. It says they stood, he saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea were those who had been victorious over the beast and his image over the number of his name. That Sea of glass mixed with fire. It could be that this is a symbolic uh, a illusion of the fact that there's a time of judgment of those who dwell on the earth. The idea of fire. Or it could just simply refer to the bloody persecution that the martyrs have passed through. We don't really know what this, this uh, sea of glass mixed with fire is. It could be either of those things. But the, the, the important thing about this is what they had in their hands. They had harps in their hands. Now, normally, you'd look at harps and go, oh, gosh. I'll, like, if there's one thing I don't want to do in heaven is play a harp. Um, but biblically, the fact that they're holding harps, this was a sign of their victory. Harps, always in Scripture, are expressions of praise and worship. And so you see these who have been martyred engaging in praise and worship of God. These were victors who were expressing their joy of their victory by their songs of praise. They, they weren't joyful that they had life. They were joyful that they had victory. And their victory 
was secured and proven in their death. This is amazing. That they weren't giving uh, shouts of praise and joy that they had life on earth protected from the devil. They were given songs of praise and singing songs of praise and joy because they were victorious even in death. This is a, these are amazing, amazing faith-filled people. Hope I'm like them. Uh, verse 3, And saying, they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. This is their song. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of Ages. A song of Moses and a song of the Lamb. It, there's discussion. I don't know how much it matters, but there's discussion. Is this one song or is it two songs? Is it one song, the song of Moses and of the Lamb, or is it two songs, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb? Either way, it includes both Old Testament and New Testament principles and precedent. Old Testament, song of Moses, obviously deliverance from Egypt. New Testament, song of the Lamb, delivered from the hatred and hostility of the beast. It's interesting to note um, that God delivered Israel while Egypt uh, from Egypt while pouring out plagues on Egypt. Israel's still there. God just poured out plagues on Egypt with Israel in it and protected them in the midst of it. Um, and apparently God will deliver his people from uh, the worshipers of the beast while pouring out plagues on the worshipers of the beast. And this song that they sing is just proclaiming the mighty acts of God. It's great Old Testament imagery that God is great and wonderful, the Lord Almighty, just and true, the King of the Ages. You go back to Psalm 92, 5, Psalm 111, 2, and Psalm 139, 14, all uses the same words. So there's great Old Testament imagery in, uh, in, in the worship of, 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 of God that these sing. Um, in this time of tribulation, it will appear as though it will seem like the devil has unlimited power um, to enforce all the demonic purposes uh, that he chooses to on humanity and persecute the saints. It'll seem like his, his power is unchecked. Um, and in the darkest hours of human history, in the darkest times, when it seems that Satan is the God of the present age, these martyrs will sing songs of praise to God. These martyrs will recognize that he is the true and the living God. These martyrs will exalt his name because contrary to appearance, God is the king of the ages. Even in times of martyrdom. This is one of the most impressive and moving expressions of faith in the Bible. In the midst of all this persecution, in the midst of the tribulation, these sing praises to God. I'm, I'm telling you, when you study the book of Revelation, it changes your perspective about life. Verse 4, Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now, taken out of context, some uh, think about this in terms of universalism, that all nations will come and worship before you. Um and honestly, there's a lot of Paul's writings in Ephesians 1, Philippians 2, and Colossians 1 that when he talks about all the nations of the world worshiping God, uh, it has to be understood. The idea of all nations worshiping God has to be understood in the context of the totality of the biblical uh, narrative. You go back to the Old Testament in Psalm 86 and Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 66 and Malachi 1. Uh, it, it, it talks about the, these, the nations will worship God, but it's the nations of the people who have chosen to be his. It's not universalism. Revelation 22, 2 says all nations will find their healing in God in the city of where God rules. The kingdom of God will be comprised of all nations, but not everyone in all nations will be part of the kingdom of God. These will be a, this will be a fellowship of all from all nations of people who gladly give themselves in worship and devotion to the Lord, and this is part of the plagues. Like God saying, "Look, I'm, uh, you, it's meant to turn people's hearts to Him." And I love. I mean, think about what they sing. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. The martyrs sing 
but they don't sing of the way they overcame the beast. There's no trace of personal vengeance over their enemies in their song. The entire song is completely occupied with the sovereignty and the justice and the glory of God. It's all God-centered. It's not them-centered. And it's not even over the fact that their lives have been vindicated by victory over the beast. It's just in worship and, and exalting the glory of God. This is an incredible, incredible um, perspective. Verse 5, after this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle, the testimony was opened. These final seven plagues occur as a result of the emptying of the bowls that have been carried by the angels from the very presence of Almighty God. And this is a proleptic vision of heaven being opened, the temple of God in heaven being opened, uh, where we saw earlier the, that the Ark of the Covenant is seen. It's a reminder that God is faithful to his promises. It's a reminder that God is faithful to his demands uh, of judgment over evil. It's, it's a reminder of, of how, how wonderfully beautiful and powerful and in control and faithful that God is. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean shining linen and wore gold sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Usually, John doesn't describe the appearance of angels in his writing. Um, he does a little bit here. Um, out of the temple came seven angels, seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. He gives a little bit of description of what they're like. It's, it, that, that's unique. In John's writings, one of the four living creatures. Again, these four living creatures, we've seen these before throughout the throughout the Revelation. Uh, they they stand close to the throne of God, and they're given bowls full of the wrath of God, with divine permission and authority to to, to carry out God's wrath upon the worshippers of the beast. And the Bible uses a bowl there. It's it's really bowl in, in that in that in, in those days was a shallow vessel. It wasn't like a deep bowl. It was like a shallow vessel. Uh, that was used for drinking or, or used for the, the pouring out of libations of wine. Um, bowls are also mentioned in Revelation 5.8 uh, that contained the, contain the prayers of the saints. Um, God's the Prayers of God's people have a role. They're not the defining factor, but they certainly have a role in the final expression of God's justice and wrath upon the world. And we ought to be praying, so right, Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This ought to be part of our daily prayers. Um, these golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Although this, and again, I keep coming back to this because Revelation keeps coming back to this. Although it seems that evil dominates the lives of humanity, God is eternal and his purposes cannot and will never be thwarted or frustrated. Not even by the devil, not even by all the satanic forces of hell itself. He, God, lives up forever and ever. In verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels uh, were completed. In the Old Testament, God manifested himself to the people, uh, to, people to, to his people, but never in the fullness of God. He was, was always somewhat veiled, because mankind cannot exist in the fullness of God's glory. The temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. We can't, gain, we, we can't get a glimpse of the fullness of God in our humanity. I mean, you, you go back to when God revealed himself in the presence of people and how he kind of cloaked himself. Go back to Exodus 40, 1 Kings 8, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 6, and Ezekiel 44, about how, how, how God, when God showed up and, and the people were there, the, the, the foundations uh, were shaken. It was the, the places were filled with smoke. God, God covered uh, eyes so that He couldn't be completely and fully seen. This is, uh, and again here, the temple's filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. He's not to be taken lightly. The emphasis is not so much on the uh, unapproachableness of God as much as it is on his majesty and his glory. God is unapproachable. 
in one hand. But the emphasis is that the reason why he's unapproachable is because his majesty and glory is so profound. The emphasis is on how extraordinary God is, especially when compared to all that is human. The emphasis is on the magnificence of God because he is transcendent. And again, I keep coming back to the days that we're in that, that um, we get so locked into what it is we're experiencing on earth right now and how much we don't like it. Uh, and, we, and we get so wrapped up in the immediacy of, of, of our experience. We, we lose sight of God trans, God's transcendence, regardless of what it appears like is going on. God is transcendent. He lives forever and ever. He's in control and he's sovereign. And the goal of our lives on this earth is just simply to remain faithful in our love and devotional worship of this incredible, holy, glorious, transcendent God. 